Welcome to Friendly Conversation. Today, our guest is Jeremy Yang, a district councillor in Hong Kong and also formerly served in Hong Kong government. Hello, Jeremy. Hi. I know you worked at the renowned UK-based international school in Hong Kong for many years. Many Western people are talking about Hong Kong is not a nice place to live after national security law and very strict COVID measures. Is it true? Well, I think for the COVID, it is partly true because we are adapting a very different strategy to fight COVID compared to the rest of the world. Um, I just recently returned from the UK and Thailand where there is basically no more restrictions and the society has collectively accepted the risk of catching COVID and the consequences. But for Hong Kong, I guess we value life slightly differently. Um, every single life really matters, especially the elderly and the infants. So I think the uh, quarantine measure is making life a little bit difficult for foreigners to come to Hong Kong. But going forward, I think we have seen signs of improvement, the reduction of the seven days into three plus four. I guess uh, we will sooner or later eventually relax the uh, measures. And with that relaxation, I think Hong Kong will be back to the good old self. Now, you mentioned about the national security law. Not a single foreigner friend that I know who are in Hong Kong or living abroad has even mentioned that. It's not really relevant for them. So I think it's, it's a bit of a hearsay. Right. Uh, we all know international school places are one of the key factors for expatriates to decide whether to move to Hong Kong. So if an overseas friend seeks your advice on the quality of international school education in Hong Kong, how would you respond to him? I think Hong Kong is a very international and diverse society. Uh, we have over 50 or so international schools to choose from, from kindergarten all the way to senior school. And they're actually available in every single district. Yes, there are uh, limited space available for especially the younger cohorts in the middle of the Hong Kong island. But if people are willing to travel a little bit, um, there are plenty of spaces. And um, I think especially now, as I mentioned, because of COVID, some people have returned home and they're waiting to come back to Hong Kong. I think this is the perfect time to come to Hong Kong and choose a school for your children especially for expats with young children, come to Hong Kong, it's a great place to live. So as I suppose the schools you know, in Hong Kong offer different courses, right? Curriculum like IB, uh, A-level, uh, whatever, right? Yes, uh, in international schools in Hong Kong or private schools, um, they are basically the American system, um, the UK system, GCSA A-level, and then the IB system. Uh, there are of course other curriculum schools specially designed for expats nationals, such as Singapore international schools, Canadian international schools, Japanese international schools. If foreigners coming from those countries would like to have their children enjoy their own national curriculum, the choices are here. I think uh, the, the best thing about Hong Kong international schools is because the government allows a certain percentage of local students going to international schools. So for a foreigner to bring their children to Hong Kong, they're getting the best of both worlds. They're getting their own country's curriculum school, but at the same time mixing with some locals. So you, you, you actually get the real life of Hong Kong rather than living in a bubble. So what's the policy of uh, international schools in Hong Kong and, and is the government going to build more schools? I think the government has uh, allowed the launch of several new international schools in the past five years. So it would take some time to absorb those uh, supply of places. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the government is in any hurry to build more. Um, maybe with, if, when the expats come back in, in droves, maybe we will run out of space soon. But I, I think right now the supply is plenty. Uh, but the general rule of thumb is that for an international school in Hong Kong, the majority of the students must be non-locals. Right. Uh, ballpark figure is about 70%. So you can expect to see about 30% local Hong Kong students, but then 70% are from other nationals. Right. Uh, as you mentioned, you have just been uh, brought to two countries, Thailand and UK, where they are having very different COVID policies. So how should Hong Kong move forward to balance our openness to the world and also to the mainland, which is very important to us? 
I think the uh, two countries I mentioned have something very much in common, uh, is that the vaccination rate across the population is extremely high. Right. For Phuket, because it is uh, part of Thailand that is 100% uh, supported by tourism, they are under tremendous pressure to open up. And that's why earlier this year, they actually launched the first, what we call the sandbox society. So everyone in there must be fully vaccinated. Um, then they cannot leave and they cannot cross contaminate with other parts of the country. And that really attracted a lot of other tourists to come because they don't need to quarantine. So, so I think uh, for England, again, high vaccination rate across all ages. In fact, it's the mirror, uh, the opposite of Hong Kong. Their elderly, uh, their infants has the highest vaccination rate, which I think makes a lot of sense because they are the most vulnerable individuals. In Hong Kong, it's the other way around. The healthy, normal, middle-aged adolescents, we are the highest vaccinated rate, but the elderly and the infants, for some reason, who are the most vulnerable are the least vaccinated. So I think what we must learn from them is boost the vaccination rate at by whatever means. Boost it up to 90%, 95%. Then I think we're in a situation to really open up. Finally, you are a district council in Hong Kong and the reform of the council is now on the agenda. What are your suggestions to the government in this respect? Well, for the past few years, the district council has been through a massive pendulum swing. Um, there were 15 of us uh, where filibusting, um, stone throwing and arguing was everyday life, which is really not good. And then came a, a, a few months of massive resignation. Um, there are only three of us left. Okay. And we can't even have a formal meeting because it requires us to have four at least. Okay. So we've gone from a full house of individuals who are really just there to fight and not to contribute mm. to the other extreme, which is only three of us left. Uh, you can't even play Mahjong have... among the three. <laughs> yeah. We're missing one. So I, I would like to see the government have a very, very fast and significant reform to ensure the same does not repeat itself. First, we need to have individuals who are, I would say, uh, real, true Hong Kongers who love Hong Kong and love our country. We cannot have individuals who hate our own country to be in the council to represent Hong Kong. That just doesn't make sense. Second, I think they must fill those empty seats ASAP. Otherwise, we're wasting uh, tax money. We're wasting time. So whatever the government do does, it will be better than right now. And the, the, the key is to move fast. Do you have any suggestions for the reform itself? I think um, election is a thing that is nice to have for district council. To be honest, the predecessor to district council, which is the urban council, that was never elected. It was all appointed. The, the key is for the government to identify individuals who are willing to contribute and who has a representation from the society. Whether you fill those seats by elections or by appointments, to be very honest, I don't really care. Just fill those seats. Thank you very much, Jeremy. That is the Welcome. end of this program. If you like our program, please share, like, and subscribe our Friday Everyday channel. I'm Henry Ho. See you next time.